Hey friends, so for today's video, I'm going to be talking about uh, The Dispossessed by Ursula Le K. Le Guin, which um, I enjoyed quite a lot. And uh, I was not expecting... Well, let's try and talk about the backstory or the, the, the context of me and Le Guin, right? So I remember reading The Wizard of Earthsea when I was uh, about maybe 13 or 14. Uh, I remember thinking that I, I, I didn't really enjoy it at the time. At the time, I think I thought it was rather bland. And, uh, you know, I, I was hoping for, for a lot of, of excitement and, and, and like bold, sharp, uh, stunning, you know, visual, like a very, you know, extravagant kind of fantasy. And... I think what I remember of The Wizard of Earthsea, and now again, I haven't read this in 17 years, I think. But what I remember of it was that it was kind of Spartan. It was kind of uh, earthy. <laughs> Wizard of Earthsea, right? It was quite earthy, yeah? It was quite grounded. It was quite, um, you know, simple. I, I think there was a sophistication in its simplicity that I didn't appreciate as a kid. And I think that comes through in The Dispossessed as well. I think it is, it's a part of uh, Le Guin's style, which I appreciate now as an adult, I guess. And I think um, why that is... I guess, again, when like now I'm thinking to myself, I guess maybe when you're younger, you're looking for like like just, you know, spectacle, right? Like stuff that's, that's new and fresh and bright and colorful. And, and like you've seen like the kind of stuff that... I mean, look at YouTube viral content and it's um, the the cover photos and how kind of, uh, <laughs> how, how spectacular they are. And yeah, you know, I think it's, it's normal for kids to want cheerful, colorful things. Which isn't to say that, you know, there isn't cheerfulness in Le Guin's work. There is, and, and, and I like it very much. And, uh, okay, let me talk about the story for a bit, right? So, oh, no, even before the story, I'll talk about how I got around to it. I think I, I enco over the years, I've encountered quotes from the dispossessed online, on Twitter, on just randomly. And I always liked the quotes. I liked the premise. I think the premise that was sold to me in those quotes was, okay, there's some, there's, there is, well, I, I didn't know at the time that, like the specifics of how it's going to play out. But how I thought about it was there is the Earth or an Earth-like planet and there is the Moon or a Moon-like planet. And the the people on the Moon are anarchists. They are like, you know, they 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 live in a, in a different social order, completely different from the whole planet. That's my understanding. And, you know, they are communist i guess or, or socialist or you know well again all of these labels are so loaded and different people come to this conversation with different assumptions about what those words mean but you know in practice um the people of anaris they don't have they don't really have property they don't really believe in ownership they kind of sh they share everything it's uh and it's just what i enjoyed about the quotes and i'm gonna pull up some of these quotes from goodreads what I enjoyed about these quotes was that, you know, it it presents a, a different way of seeing, right? And so the thing about seeing is that, you know, like, so I really enjoy Mean Girls, right? The, the movie and a, a, a big part of what's great about Mean Girls is that there is the social reality of the, the American high school and there is this the, the protagonist Katie she comes from Africa maybe South Africa I'm not sure and she grew up she was basically homeschooled right or she grew up with her parents who were I don't know like on a safari like maybe whatever she, she didn't grow up in a conventional school environment so the school environment is new to her and so she gets to make comments about so, so the Mean Girls is fascinating to watch because on top of like, okay, the decisions that happen and the politics and all those things, you get to see your usual familiar high school environment, but through the eyes of someone who was outside of it, 
right? So in outsiders, outsiders have a perspective on our social reality that we can't even conceive because they approach it from a different perspective. They see it from a different angle. You don't know what you look like from where you are, right? So and and you know I think that is a great motivation for people to to for space exploration to colonize the Mars and the Moon because the people who go there will end up having a different perspective on Earth and it's healthy to have multiple perspectives. It it, it enriches it enriches us. It enriches the world, right? It just enriches the conversations. You 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 just have a better like multiple perspectives on the same thing give you a better understanding of the thing. Right? You see it from here, you see it from here. Anyway. Um yeah, so there is for each of us deserve everything. For for we each of us deserve everything. Uh no, let me skip that. Let me skip that. Uh We have nothing but our freedom. We have nothing to give you but your own freedom. We have no law but the single principle of mutual aid between individuals. We have no government but the single principle of free association. We have no states, no nations, no presidents, no premiers, no chiefs, no generals, no bosses, no bankers, no landlords, no wages, no charity, no police, no soldiers, no wars. Nor do we have much else. We are sharers, not owners. We are not prosperous. None of us is rich. None of us is powerful. If it is an RS you want, if it is the future you seek, then I tell you that you, ha- you must come to it with empty hands. You must come to it alone and naked as a child comes into the world, into his future, without any past, without any property, wholly dependent on other people for his life. You cannot take what you have not given and you must give yourself. You cannot buy the revolution. You cannot make the revolution. You can only be the revolution. It's in your spirit or it is nowhere. Uh, here's another one. A child free from the guilt of ownership and the burden of economic competition will grow up with the will to do what needs doing and the capacity for joy in doing it. It is useless work that darkens the heart. The delight of the nursing mother, of the scholar, of the successful hunter, of the good cook, of the skillful maker, of anyone doing needed work and doing it well. This durable joy is perhaps the deepest source of human affection and societal society, sociality as a whole. Um. Yeah. Uh, I'm once again reminded that I'm not a fan of quotes website quote websites because they ha- people have a habit of picking out the most kind of obvious quotes that aren't necessarily the most interesting ones. Let me go through my book for things that I've underlined to look for interesting things. Um, the okay. So one of the things I I loved about the book that I was kind of afraid of. I was afraid that it wouldn't be the case, but it is the case. I was afraid that the book was going to be a kind of simplistic, oh, anarchy good, earth bad, you know, kind of a simplistic frame. But it's not. It it does demonstrate, um, you know, kind of um, the weaknesses of every um, way of being. So it's not that... An- Anaris is not a paradise. It's, you know, and... And while the people are happier in some ways, um, they, they, they do have politics, they do have unhappiness, they do have frustrations. It's just a different class of, of, uh, of pain. You know, uh, one, one bit that I really enjoyed was when, um, so Shevek, who's the m- main character, he goes to, so he, he is a physicist and he goes to um, Uras, which is like the earth in the book. And he he spends some time with Via. Via is like a, I think she's a, she might be like a wealthy man's wife, or she is. Um, she, so she 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 has a conversation with him. She spends a day with him, and it's kind of you know it's interesting. There's a tension to it. There's there's some sexual tension. There's some some flirting some some confusion and it's very very interesting to see how how that conversation plays out it um it you know she they each think that the other person is not free you know they each see how the other person seems to be be shackled in some ways by their world view and um mm, what am i looking for he... 
you know, so he said so so um and Anaris is is and it's interesting to think about about the role of gender in this book. Cause it was written in like the seventies where, you know, sexism was even more brazen and blatant than it is now. Or like, you know, gender roles were more dramatically distinct than they are now. And, you know, um uh so he says to her, It seems that everything in your society is done by men. The industry, arts, management, government decisions. In all your life, you bear your father's name and mo- husband's name. The men go to school and you don't go to school. They are all the teachers and judges and police and governments, aren't they? Why do you let them control everything? Why don't you do what they like? And she responds, But we do. Women do exactly as they like. And they don't have to get their hands dirty or wear brass helmets or stand about shouting in the directorate to do it. So what is it that you do? Why, we run the men, of course. And you know, it's perfectly safe to tell them that because they never believe it. They say, ha ha, funny little woman, and pat your head, and stalk off with their medals jangling, perfectly self-content. Um, and then he says, and you two are self-content? And she says, indeed I am. I don't believe it. Because it doesn't fit your principles. Men always have theories and things always have to fit them. And then he says, no, it's not because of theories, it's because I can see that you're not content. You are restless, unsatisfied, dangerous. And she laughs and she says, dangerous, what a marvelous compliment. And, you know, it's, 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 is this, so, so it's bits like this from the book that, that I really enjoy, you know, and, um, I feel like, so, so that, that, that conversation, that example of that conversation, I feel is a, is a fractal, a small, a small seed of what the book is about, which is a con- really it's a conversation between different worldviews and the, the tensions between different worldviews. And you know, some people will say, "Oh my God, um, Le Guin is like beating us over the head with with anarchism and 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 socialism." I I don't really get that to be to be the case. You know, I I feel like um, it's an exploration of of considering alternative possibilities and cons- and its dialogue and okay I, ha- I haven't talked much about like the pace of the book so the book is very well paced it's like every chapter it it alternates every chapter between kind of um the Shevek in the present on Uras and then his past on Anaris and you learn more about the character you learn more about his history you learn more about the respective worlds um he doesn't so he starts out in a in a rich people environment and he doesn't meet poor people from Uras until towards the end of the book and that's pretty it, it the, the the pace you know it kind of goes along and then towards the end it gets it gets steeper and more climatic which is which like once you're about a third into the about two thirds into the book it then starts to really accelerate but the first two thirds are pretty great as well you know it's just uh it I feel like there is a a tension, no, a, a build up. Like you, you feel like there's something interesting going to happen, but you don't know what exactly. And there's there's a little bit of suspense there, which I which I enjoyed. And um, I think when Le Guin talks about friendship and and um, the creative life, and you know, so so Shevek is a physicist who's working on a theory of physics, of theoretical physics, and you know, I can't help but see it as her. Her talking about him working on physics feels like a, a proxy for her talking about writing as a writer herself. And and I got a lot of value out of, of you know, seeing her description as a professional author about the creative process. And, and I mean, there's nothing like novel or new here that I've never seen before, but it's just, it's comforting and it's challenging and it's just, it's a, it's, it's a joy to inhabit, like... It's like someone else who knows what they're doing talking about what they know. Like, it's, it's pleasurable. And when she talks about... Um, you know, so she she has, like, rants about about school. I mean, she rants through the characters. So here's this part where he's talking about the exam. So he, he's, a, he's a physicist, right? So he's supposed to be a teacher. And he talks about... Um, 
He was appalled by the examination system when it was explained to him. He could not imagine a greater deterrent to the natural wish to learn than this pattern of cramming in information and disgorging it at demand. At first, he refused to give any tests on grades, but this upset the university administrator so badly that, not wishing to be discourteous to his hosts, he gave in. So he asked his students to write a paper on any problem in physics that interested them, and told them that he would give them all the highest mark, so that the bureaucrats would have something to write on their forms and lists. To his surprise, a good many students came to him to complain. They wanted him to set the problems, to ask the right questions. They did not want to think about questions, but to write, about the ans- write down the answers they had learned. And some of them objected strongly to him giving everyone the same mark. So, you know, if you see how... Um, I'm reminded of, I guess, in The Matrix when uh, Morpheus tells Neo, like, people are dependent on their systems and, and they will fight to protect it, right? Like, and, and you know, so y- you don't get the sense that Shivak is right and they are wrong. You know, he, he learns that, that there is a different way of being and it's just different. And I, I feel similarly as, as a Singaporean, right, when I visit America, so when I visited California, right, and I got to see how things are different. I got to see how, you know, even, and because I've only been to one state in the US so far, I don't know how much of what I experience is America and how much is California and how much is the Bay Area. You know, it's 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 unclear. To me, it's all, it was all my experience of America, right? So I don't know what is what. I have to, I was hoping to go to New York later this month to, to disambiguate that, but that's not an option anymore. But I will get around to it eventually. But anyway, um, yeah, so, you know, I saw homeless people on the streets. That seemed sad and tragic and unfortunate. Uh, but at the same time, you know, I went to Dolores Park and people were laughing and, and having fun and, and you could smell the marijuana in the air. And like in, in Singapore, like marijuana is, is, or any drugs really, is, is so illegal that, you know, it's like so illegal. It's not just slightly illegal. And... um just lots and lots of things like that. Like, uh, I had to tip. Here in Singapore, we don't tip. And, like, you know, which is which is better? Like, I don't know. Like, um, every service staff I encountered in the US was so kind and friendly. Well, no, there was this one bartender at some bar who was just not. But, like, I encountered so many acts of really kind service. Whereas in Singapore, I feel like, um, well, people, things are changing and, and there's different attitudes and stuff. But... The norm is the the kind of core norm is different. I I find and I I liked what I saw in a comic once that in Singapore I think we feel that um, a respectful interaction is one where we leave each other alone. Kind of like we I respect your space, you respect my space. We we nod, we we hand over, we say thank you, cheers. But like it we we don't get as close. And the thing is, a person who's only ever used to people being close might think of that as oh that's distant. But it's just a different way of relating to what courtesy means you know and um, yeah so I, I enjoyed this book as a as a as a sort of as a thought experiment as a way of inhabiting kind and thoughtful characters trying to make an effort to understand each other's point of view uh, there was also you know a sense of of possibility a sense of what is tragic and yeah i i don't know if i have uh sold the book properly but i recommend it i think it's it's pretty easy to read it's not that long it's a uh it's what 300 pages uh it's fairly easy reading and it it flows from chapter to chapter um it's more nuanced then it might be sold. It's funny. So, like the at the back of the book, it says the principle of simultaneity will revolutionize interstellar civilization by making possible instantaneous communication. It is the life work of Shevek, a brilliant physicist from the arid anarchist world of Anaris. Shevek's work is being stifled by jealous colleagues, so he travels to Anaris' sister planet Uras, hoping to find more tolerance there. But he seen he soon finds himself being used as a pawn in a deadly game. That's so dramatic. Um, it's it's technically true. But it doesn't. It doesn't represent the the vibe of the book. You know, the the book has. I would say it has a more scholarly pa- until the end, I guess, right? But for the most part, I felt that the book had a rather scholarly pace. It was a. I guess maybe you could even think about it. Maybe like the early seasons of Game of Thrones versus the late ones. But I might just be mixing my my stories a bit too much there. But yeah, I, I'm glad I read it. 
I look forward to reading it again. I have a lot of underlines and notes that I would like to revisit. Um, some parts of it feel slightly overwrought, like, but I believe that the reason it feels overwrought is because I think this book has seeped into the culture in some ways, so much so that things that now seem self-evident did not at the time. So like when, when talking about gender, I think there are times where there are times where the things that that Le Guin says about, you know, like uh, motherhood and and just um you know even so at some point she talks about like homosexual relations in kind of in the same breath as as um heterosexual relations. And it occurred to me while reading it that that would have been pretty radical for a mainstream reader in the 70s. Like, just to to think that people might be thinking about heterosexual and homosexual relationships kind of in the same breath, which which now I think a lot of Western society, modern society, has has come to accept, but very recently, right? Very, um, only like, you know, like, not even in Obama's first term, right? Like, gay marriage was legalized in the states across all countries in what 2015 it's not that long ago but this book was written in the 70s so in a way some of this book kind of like uh it's a, and i felt the same way about dune i kind of wish i could go back in time and read it i mean you, you can like even if you go back in time you're going back with your current knowledge but like um it was it i believe this was a book ahead of its time and you know we may still say that in the future because because until we have some human settlement that is not on earth like what do we know about what off earth off planet culture is going to be like and what that perspective is going to be like anyway i recommend this book um get it read it enjoy it done